from our previous ways that we look to science and really no answers in terms of how to deal with a lot of the issues that we're dealing with in our current circumstance. Despite all our technological, te techno technological advances in our modern world, we are more depressed than ever, we're more suicidal than ever, we're more addicted to drugs than ever, we're more unwell than ever. And when we look for guidance, the technologies outpacing our ability to know how to cope with these changes. Because these are technological advances that shift cultures, shift lifestyles, shift schedules. And we are in a time where we don't really have that guidance and it is all the more important to look for that guidance from other places, from a higher source. And the beauty of this is, the bottom line is the Prophet Wasallam warned us about these times and he gave us solutions for these times. So let's click into this for a little bit. We look at our technological advances. We have cell phones, we have food that can be delivered to our front door. We have every variety of food. We have every variety of novelty on our cell phones. We have the ability to connect with each other, to family members, to build strong social support networks. Yet despite that, we're more unwell than, than ever. We have the ability to work from home and not go out to work. Eating food is no longer something that we have to plan out. Just at the snap of your fingers, it's there. And despite that, we're more anxious. We have more time on our hands. We're more anxious. We're more depressed than ever. So when we look at the statistics over the last 25, uh, over the last 20 years, suicide rates have increased by 35%. Now it's more likely to die from an opioid overdose than a car accident. Drug overdoses are the leading cause of death in adults greater than 45, younger than 45. So we're living in strange times. We're living in times where even, that's just death. When we look at, for example, just feeling unwell, what leads to suicide in most cases is depression. When we look at the depression and anxiety rates, they're going through the roof and constantly increasing. And this is over time. So there's no real, it's a, it's a trend. It's not like we're figuring it out or there's a solution uh, that we're gonna see a, a, a turnaround. Same thing with overdose deaths. Put that aside for a second. Drug use is just increasing. Alcohol use is increasing. Alcohol deaths are the third leading preventable cause of death and increasing. Okay, put away drugs and alcohol for a second. We are just feeling unwell in general as a community and as a people, as a modern people. Uh, forget if you want to call it depression or anxiety. We have, we're just feeling a lack of purpose and unfulfilled. And if you don't want to call it anxiety, stress or overwhelmed, and we have a variety of ways to escape this. So forget drugs and alcohol. We have a variety of ways to escape this through social media, Facebook, cell phones, a, an endless variety of digital drugs. So if you step back for a moment and you think about all of our conveniences, people 500 years ago, if they looked at how we lived, they would think, I would savor every moment of that. I would be in Jannah, I'd be in heaven. But despite that, we're not savoring it. We're looking for different ways to escape, to escape it, to check out. And, and we're feeling more unwell than ever. So the beauty of this is the Prophet Wasallam told us about these times. He warned us about these times. He told us as time progresses, intoxicants will be widespread. He told us as time progresses, zina will be widespread. Fornication will be widespread. He told us as time progresses, different types of distraction will be widespread. People will wish they were dead because of the severity of the pain that they're in. But the, so, you know, the, the interesting thing about that is, it could have been rationally poss possible that intoxicants weren't widespread. Let's just look at one of those signs because it can be overwhelming. He described these signs to us as if we're looking around us right now. 
And you gotta imagine, we're inheritors of a tradition that's 1400 years long. People were talking about the science for generations and they were looking around and not seeing it. And they're thinking, how could this be? How would that even make sense? How could fornication be widespread? And we're at a time where we're, we're looking around and thinking, how could, wh when was there ever a, ch a time not like that? Or we're certainly in a trend where our children are gonna be asking that question. So it's interesting. Let's just look into the intoxication, intoxicants being widespread. It could have been rationally possible that we've been fighting this drug epidemic for 50 years with the war on drugs. It could have been rationally possible that we won that war. Look at all the other wars we had. It could have been rationally possible that we could have coordinated an effort to eradicate drugs as a problem. If you look at smallpox, people came together, coordinated, worldwide effort. Smallpox affected the whole world. A worldwide effort to eradicate completely this disease, smallpox, that had been around for centuries. So it could have been rationally impossible that intoxicants weren't widespread as we progress. Uh, but it's the um, amazing, uh, miraculous nature of the Pasal Salman that he was able to warn us about these things. He was able to warn us about these things. And that's really an important treasure. Allah says in the Quran, Udhkuru ni'matullahi alaykum idja'ala fikum anbiya. Remember, be mindful, don't forget the ni'mah, the blessing of Allah when He blessed you with prophets. And we have the last prophet. We have the messenger of Allah. What a blessing. And it could have been that He just gave us this advice and said, figure it out. He could have just gave us this advice and said, it's going to come, I'm warning you about it, be careful. Just be a little bit more cautious. But he gave us the advice, and then he gave us the solution. He gave us the advice, and then he gave us the solution. So, before we go into the solution, just think about this for a moment. He gave us this advice as a signal, and he said, he gave us directions. He said, when this happens, it's a signal to do this. Like you give somebody directions, you say go down 10th Street, and when you get to the corner, you'll see a bush, then take a right. So when you walk, the signal to take a right is 10th Street in a bush. So when the Prophet Wasallam is telling us this information that's for us, passed down for us, it behooves us to be ready, prepared, and willing to take that information and the, those solutions. So, the Prophet said, when we see these signs, when the time progresses, when we see these signs and we see this, this ihtilaf, these fitan at the end of times, these, this confusion, these trials at the end of time, he told us what? He told us to hold firmly to the book and the sunnah, the Quran and the sunnah. Not that we forget about the Quran and sunnah for 12, 13, 1400 years, and then it's relevant 1400 years later. Of course, it's always been re relevant. We've always had the Quran and Sunnah to guide us. Now, the difference is the holding on to it. Holding on to it firm. You know, like you hit turbulence on a plane, you hold on to your seat. You get the fasten uh, your seatbelt sign and you hold on to your seat. This is the time to hold firmly to the Quran and the, sun and the Sunnah especially when we're not finding answers on a population level for all of these problems. Of course there's treatment. There's treatments for suicide, depression, addiction. Of course there is, and it works. That's important to recognize that if you're in these problems, there, are, there is treatment, there is hope. But what I'm talking about is a bigger picture of prevention, of working on this from a long-term perspective, from a prevention perspective. Um, so the Prophet ﷺ told us to hold on to the Qur'an and Sunnah. He told us to hold on to the Qur'an and Sunnah. And it's not that the, the Qur'an and Sunnah was relevant 1400 years ago and not relevant now. Don't fall for that. That's the fallacy. 
It's not that it was re relevant a thousand years ago and it wasn't relevant now. Don't be duped. How could it be that this is some sort of tradition or superstition or culture that we just do it like it's some superstition in order to ward off some, you know, make-believe harm? This is a lifestyle that's been designed for us. The same one that knew that these problems were going to exist is the same one that designed this lifestyle for us. This was a lifestyle by design to protect. And it's important to take it fully. Allah says in the Quran, Udkhulu fi silmi kafa. Enter into the deen comprehensively. This is a, a lifestyle that is an immunization from the problems that we are facing in our current, current circumstance. So it's important to recognize that the Quran and Sunnah, that our deen is not for the past, that the exempt for us, and now we just have to hold on to it. It's meaningless, it doesn't have a function, it doesn't operate in our, it has no utility in our current circumstance. Of course not. We talked about how it will, all of these signs were passed down and irrelevant for many generations until they came to us. So of course the solution is going to be relevant to us. And on that line of reasoning, we shouldn't fall for the fact that the Quran and Sunnah is for men at the exempt of women, as if Allah is a man and not a woman. That's, that's foolish. The Quran and Sunnah is not for adults, at the, exempt, at, at the expense of women, I mean at the, exempt of, at, at the expense of children. It's not for the rich at the expense of the poor. It's not for, the ex, uh, for some tribe versus the expense of some other tribe. The other people just have to kind of go along with it so that these people can benefit from it 1400 years ago. So it's important to recognize that our tradition has answers and it has answers that are relevant. We gotta look, we gotta look. أقول قول هذا واستغفر الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله so the Quran and Sunnah has a comprehensive way of life for us to adopt. This isn't a slogan. This is serious. And in many instances, it's life and death in the circumstances that we're in now. The Quran and Sunnah is a comprehensive lifestyle we're meant to hold on to. And, and that's important. So let's look into this. Let's go into a few principles of the Quran and Sunnah for our times. One important principle is tarbiyatul awlad, nurturing our children. The way to nurture our children, there's a whole Islamic science behind this. We're missing. We're missing it. There's a whole way to raise your children that's based on the Quran and Sunnah. It guides us in this in this manner, and it's important for us to, to understand this. So I'm going to highlight two points from this idea of raising children, tarbiyah, which is number one, the Prophet wasallam gave attention to people. He gave attention to people. This was his way of being. When he looked at somebody, he give his whole he told turn his whole direction towards them. And that's connected to his, the way he was at home, the way he was with his children, the way he was with the young Sahaba. So one of the things that our scholars caution us to these days in terms of raising children is, although it seems like we have more time on our hands, maybe the work day gets shorter, maybe we don't have a commute. We have a hundred different ways to stay connected and track our children and connect with them. Although it seems like that, because of all the fitan of this time and all the issues that we're dealing with, we're not spending enough time with our children. There's not enough energy and time spent with our children. And the Qur'an is filled with the dua of the anbiya, the prayers of the prophets, and their concern for their children. Sure, for their, their ummah, but their children. 
This is something they dedicated, they carved out time for. They studied. This is something they dedicated and carved out time for. And it's important for us to dedicate energy, time, attention into how we raise our children. Second thing about this real quick point I want to make about raising our children is that it's important to um, it's important to recognize that Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a method of, of his tarbiyah. So we can all agree that praying salah, honesty, reliability, standing on one's own two feet, respect for parents, all these things are important. We can all agree on that. We all strive for that. There's no deficiency here. But the way in which we enact that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with the young Sahaba, he had rifq, he had mercy, rahma, he had he was flexible with them. He would play with them. He was predominantly merciful to them. He was predominantly um, inviting. And this was his his uh, his method. We know about the story of the uh, the uh, the man who came to the Prophet and asked him for, to, for permission to commit zina. And then he walked him through a process of logic. The people were were rebuking him. But the Prophet Sallallahu he walked them through a process of logic. Would you like this for your mother? Would you like this for your sister? And then light bulb goes off. He understood it through a process of logic and love. And this is his way, this is his mode. It's hard. But the, the, the idea is progress, not perfection. Because a lot of these issues that we're suffering uh, in, in our days is because we left this. We left this and we're, we're focusing on putting out the fire and not the prevention and dealing with the risk factors of a lot of the issues. The third thing I want to uh, say about this is tarbiyah is not like our parents are responsible for everything. Like, they, if they forgot a few things in the enormous blessing of parents, now we hold that against them for the rest of their lives. Parents are an incredible blessing. We have to take it upon ourselves, do our self-reflection, recognize what pieces are missing, and then find people who can do that tarbiyah for us. So the murabbi is the parents, but you can also find people to help you work on your character, to run things past, to talk to, to have a committee as opposed to being stuck in our heads. So this is something that eventually we have to take this responsibility on ourselves. The first pass is our parents. They get us started. The rest of it is up to us to figure out where am I missing, what are my habits that I keep coming back to, that I swear off but I keep coming back to them. Let me focus in on that. Because if opens the door of shaitan, shoulda, woulda, coulda opens the door of shaitan. The other important aspect I want to bring up is the gradual nature of change. So a lot of the issues in terms of mental health, in terms of addiction, in terms of generally just feeling unwell, we have to recognize that the principle within Islam is a gradual change. It's a gradual change. When the ayat of prohibiting khamar came down, intoxicants came down, it came down gradually. The first ayah was in Surah Al-Baqarah. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنَ الْخَمَرْ وَالْمَيْسِرِ They ask you about intoxicants and gambling. Because gambling is addictive. They ask you about intoxicants and gambling. Chemical and behavioral addictions. And then, and then Allah says, say in them is, uh, is harm. وَإِثْمُهُمَا أَكْبَرُ مِنْ نَفْدِهِمَا And their harm is greater than their benefit. So it first started coming down with the logic of all of this. That, yeah, let's acknowledge that it's doing something for us. This behavior, this like, uh, you know, mode of communication with my spouse or my child, or this addiction to my cell phone, which I even want to give up. I, I want to stop TikToking, but I can't. I want to stop this, but I can't. Uh, four hours of it, and I feel completely unfulfilled afterwards, binging on, you know, you name it, and I'm, you know, exhausted afterwards. I feel unfulfilled, purposeless after, afterwards. The idea is to recognize that it does something for something for us, and but recognizing the harms and using logic and again love. Then the second ayah came down. La taqrabu salata wa antum sukara. 
Don't come close to Salah while you're intoxicated. So now, once the logic and the process, the heart and minds are right, because it's not like give it off or you fail. That's part of the problem. You know, perfection is the enemy of progress. We don't want to even venture down changing that habit because it's, it's never going to happen. It's not possible. Of course it's possible. Of course it's possible if we take it step by step and give ourselves time. So there was restrictions placed on intoxicants. Don't drink during Salah. So that's really just after Isha. So placing restrictions on those habits or those conversations. When I get heated with my children, with my spouse, that's it. Once my voice goes above this decibel, time for me to just go somewhere, to remove myself, restrict myself. When I get to this internet website, time for me to restrict myself. When I catch the 30 minute limit on the, the cell phone because for the social media or whatever, restrict myself, put those restrictions on ourselves. And restrictions are in the terms of time, like we see in this ayah, but they're also, neuroscientists repeatedly show uh, the order of distance. So just putting that bag of junk food in the garage, as opposed to in your cabinet, where you gotta walk a little bit further, putting that cell phone, leaving it downstairs when you're unwinding upstairs, and go before you go to bed, leaving it in another room, has been shown to be incredibly helpful in reducing engagement in these things. So that's physical and time distance. But then we also have the distance in the digital world where it's important to take advantage of all these things that restrict our digital activity. So that's, that's, that's that restriction. And, uh, and the Quran and Sunnah is filled with this. Filled with this. There's so much to talk about here. But suffice to say that we're in interesting times and there's an incredible amount of hope. But my dear brothers and sisters, don't be duped. There's treatment out there, take it. There's treatment out there, take it. But there's so much more to life than just preventing crisis or stopping crisis. There's joy that our deen tells us. <laughs> يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم ربنا آتينا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم أرنا حقا حقا وارزقنا سباعا وارنا باطلا باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابا اللهم وفتنا لما تحب وترضى اللهم اجمعنا في إبادك الصالحين وجعلنا منهم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإنتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيذكم لعلكم تذكرون وأخي مصر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر